Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. It's good to see you all in person. It's, uh, it's, it's a rare but a, a, a wonderful opportunity we have in this season to begin to meet again. And it's a pleasure to have a conversation about a book, to just indulge ourselves in a long conversation about a book. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to a discussion of David de Savage's new book, The Decline and Rise of Democracy, A Global History from Antiquity to Today, which was published last year by Princeton University Press. This event launches not one, but two democratic initiatives. It's the first public event of the democracy curriculum, which just this fall began offering a new course in the social sciences core curriculum titled Democracy, Equality, Liberty, and the Dilemmas of Self-Government. This morning, Professor Savage met with students currently enrolled in the Democracy Corps, and over lunch, he engaged a working group of our faculty in an extended conversation arising from major issues raised by his book. We invite inquiries, particularly from undergraduates, about our plans for future public events like this one, as well as faculty-led research opportunities for students. We chose the decline and rise of democracy for our maiden voyage because it does so many things so well. Its chronological as well as geographical scope is breathtaking. This is a truly global study that covers a vast span of human history from ancient societies to contemporary democracies around the world. And the book is provocative. As the title indicates, it's quite contrarian. Since given, we've become accustomed to gloomy rise and fall narratives, but this one tells us that there's a fall and rise. But we all know that the University of Chicago cannot resist a contrarian argument, so here we are. Finally, the book invites engagement in multiple registers. It establishes through rigorous analysis of massive troves of evidence on self-government throughout history that democracy is astonishingly widespread. It is, in fact, a basic and recurring mode of social and political organization that's always beckoning us, if not always pursued. Alas, the same may be said of democracy's mortal enemy, autocracy. So I'll leave it to our discussants to sort that out. But I cannot think of a richer feast of ideas and evidence to sink our teeth into as we embark on a curricular initiative that seeks to analyze all sides of democratic society, whether uplifting or not. Our conversation here today also marks the launch of the Democracy Series, a joint initiative between the University of Chicago Center for Effective Government, the Chicago Center on Democracy, and the Seminary Co-op. The series hosts dialogues between book authors and experts on issues related to the state of democracy in the US and abroad. And in the coming months, you should keep your eyes open for future book events like this one. Okay, now let me introduce our discussants. David de Savage is the Dean of Social Sciences and the Julius Silver Professor in NYU's Department of Politics, and he's an affiliated professor at NYU's School of Law. His book, The Decline and Rise of Democracy, provides a new understanding of early democracy in multiple world regions. It explains the survival in Europe and disappearance in China and the Middle East, and it then traces the long evolution of modern democracy while highlighting its internal tensions. By exploring the deep history of democracy, both early and modern, he offers insights with great relevance to our current events and our current anxieties in a time of democratic erosion and crisis. Professor Sta Savage is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and has also authored several pr previous books, including Taxing the Rich, A History of Fiscal Fairness in the United States and Europe, Princeton 2016, and States of Credit, Size, Power, and the Development of European Polities, Princeton, 2011. For the discussion today, Professor Stasavage will be joined on our stage by William Howell. Professor Howell is the Director of the Center for Effective Government, the Sidney Stein Professor in American Politics at the University of Chicago, and the Chair of the Political Sciences Department. He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He holds additional appointments in the Harris School of Public Policy and the college. He has written widely on separation of power issues and American political institutions, and he's also a host of Not Another Politics podcast. 
please join me in welcoming our discussants. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much for uh, having me here. It's been a wonderful day to start off with seeing how this great new project of three interlinked uh, democracy courses in the core is, is progressing and to be invited here tonight to, to kick off the uh, democracy series. I, I really appreciate everybody, everybody turning out and all the work that's gone into planning this visit. Um, under circumstances which are always evolving with respect to the <laughs> pandemic. And it's great that we can be here in person today. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna speak briefly about uh, some of the key thoughts from the book in order to give you an idea uh, before we discuss, uh, before we start the discussion that, that, that Will will moderate. Uh, as, as, as Jim Sparrow alluded to, one of the core ideas that I try to make and, and that I try to lay out in this book is that Democracy is not just something that was invented at one place in one time. Uh, it's a, it is a phenomenon that many human societies have experienced and practiced and invented on their own or by borrowing it from others in early times on multiple continents, whether you're talking about uh, North America before European conquest in some places, pre-colonial Africa, ancient India, early Mesopotamia at times. It is a phenomenon that is often involved the deliberation and making of decisions through councils or assemblies in which the people who are allowed to participate, and sometimes it's a, a large fraction of the people, also I'm sure we'll get to that point, participate in, in a really intensive way uh, in, in, in self-governance. And early democracy was common enough that I think we could say it was a naturally occurring phenomenon even if it wasn't inevitable. And so it wasn't just something that arose in the Greek world and then traveled elsewhere. At the same time, early democracy was not universal. There was a alternative to early democracy. And the alternative to early democracy was autocracy. And many societies have experienced autocracy at early times where instead of a ruler uh, ruling jointly with a council or an assembly and relying on members of society to help them govern and to get things done like raising taxes and collecting goods and building public works. What they did instead was to rule through a bureaucracy of their own construction. And the bureaucracy's key feature was that it had individuals who were chosen by and remunerated by the, the ruler and were not specifically dependent on individual social groups. So it was a fundamentally different trajectory for governance, uh, one that some societies still practice today. And if you consider it to be successful in the sense that it has survived, it's been successful in, in, according to that definition. What determined where early democracy arose and where autocracy arose instead? To some extent, I'd argue that this depended on the geographic environment, what sort of crops could be grown in places like China, where the early dynasties started out on the Yellow River, Low West Plateau with a certain sort of soil that could be uh, cultivated and where an intensive form of agriculture could be uh, at practice from very early date. This type of natural environment uh, tilted the balance, helped tilt the balance, didn't determine but helped tilt the balance in, in favor of a centralized large scale policy with autocratic rule. In other cases, such as Western Europe, in early times, the geographic environment did not allow for an intensive form of agriculture. It allowed for a more extensive agriculture, whereas people were spread, where output was dependent on rainfall, where it was very uncertain for rulers to be able to know what was going on in any one place, just because of variabilities in the environment and because of people being spread out so far. That was a natural environment that tended to lend itself to the cause of early democracy because rulers found it harder to control their people. They found it harder to build a bureaucracy. They needed the cooperation of the people to be able to do anything. So those are the two alternatives. And then when we think about how autocracy functioned and how early democracy sometimes declined, we often think that when we talk about democracy today, we think of democracy and say, elements of what we might call civilization are something that go together. But in practice, in early societies, civilization often advanced to the detriment of democracy. And so that's why the book has this contrarian title of the decline 
and rise of democracy rather than, rather than the opposite. That the decline of early democracy in some places was set about by events that allowed rulers to rule in new ways thanks to new technologies such as forms of writing that made it easier to track people. And when we think about technology, we can think about different torts of writing between more alphabetic, more accessible types of writing be, being accessible to a broad segment of the population versus non-alphabetic sets of writing that were often the province of only a few court bureaucrats because they were so complicated to master and that tended to lend themselves to uh, autocracy. And so therefore, we can say that in earlier times, civilization wasn't necessarily, if you think of writing being key, a key element of civilization wasn't, the, wasn't uh, something that went hand in hand with the uh, democracy being sustained. So that's early democracy, but there's also a book about a rise of a new type of democracy, and that is modern democracy as we think of it today, which is a phenomenon that emerged slowly over many centuries, I would argue, in Western Europe and in the United States, and that is a fundamentally different type of rule compared to early democracy. Early democracy, people ruled directly. If you had the right to participate, your form of participation was in intensive. Uh, you would do it on a weekly basis or sometimes even more frequently if you're thinking about how frequently a village council might meet among the Huron in, uh, in what is today uh, a part of Canada. Now, the other feature of modern democracy was that you rose, it, 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 your participation was something that occurred only from time to time view, via elections of representatives. And so participation is much more sporadic than in the case of early democracy. But at the same time, at least we make a claim to having participation be very broad in modern democracy. From its outset, that was the claim. It was a claim that certainly in this country was not met for a very long time in the sense that there was broad participation for free white males who owned a sufficient amount of property, but that early democracy, modern democracy, excuse me, then was gradually extended uh, in cases like the US and elsewhere to have broader and broader participation for all groups. So modern democracy in that way fundamentally differs from early democracy in the breadth of participation. The two fracture points of modern democracy, and I think this is relevant when we think of where we stand in the United States today, are first of all, that modern democracy is something that unlike early democracy often exists in conjunction with a strong state bureaucracy. And a strong state bureaucracy is something that might allow a leader who doesn't want to respect the result of an election, for example, to not to implement a plan to, to implement rule of another form uh, via, via, uh, via bureaucratic agencies. And so that's the first fracture point is that modern democracy has a much stronger executive via bureaucracy, and that's a potential issue. The second issue, which is equally deep, is that modern democracy, precisely because it has a form of political participation that is more uh, something that occurs only from time to time and for most people only at elections, modern democracy runs the risk of having people feel isolated and distant from government and disenchanted and becoming distrustful. Uh, and so that is a problem that is equally, equally problematic. Now, the final thing I'll say about modern democracy is that there's an issue of sequencing, which I think is critical when you think of the possibility for different polities or different countries in the world today to attain and sustain modern democracy. And one of the core arguments of the book is that there's a fundamental issue of sequencing. That if you start off with traditions of collective governance before you actually get a state bureaucracy, and this was the case of Western Europe during the medieval and early modern era, then it is possible subsequently to construct a state bureaucracy that emerges jointly as a result of a ruler, such as a king for, from England perhaps, and representatives of the people in a parliament. That make, means that under that sequence, it's possible to build a bureaucracy that builds upon these traditions of collective rule, and you can still have a way in which there's a control of the bureaucracy beyond that which is exercised by the executive. The alternative route, I think, poses much more difficulty for attaining democracy. And that is a pattern that's uh, illustrated perfectly, or very well at least, 
by China to the extent that China has followed for the last thousand, few thousand years a pattern of political development where a bureaucracy arrived first. And when a bureaucracy arrived first, there's less of an ability for people to organize some sort of collective governance. It's much more difficult. Rulers are getting what they need from the bureaucracy. They don't need to rule with the people themselves, although I know we'll talk about that in the, in the discussion uh, with Will. And so I would argue that if bureaucracy comes first, it doesn't, mean it, that it, it doesn't mean that it's impossible that democracy will subsequently be sustained. Korea provides one example of that. I'd simply say that it's a lot less likely. And with that, I will move over to start the discussion. Thank you. David, that was terrific. Um, Jim, you said sort of breathtaking in, in scope and reach, and this book decidedly is, and you just in a short order sort of laid out big themes, which I see as our task to take, well, another 15 or 20 minutes to kind of unpack, unpack a bit. Sure. Um, and explore, and then we're gonna turn and open it up to all of you. Uh, we have until 5.30 today. And um, as much as we possibly can, this is a moment of acute democratic anxiety, mm -hmm. um, and there's a an interest in these issues by reference to a set of threats that appear much more urgent than I think m many people in the room may have Im imagined several years ago. But we're gonna try as best we can to kind of resist the, the pull into the present moment in this immediate context to and, and accept your invitation to think much more expansively um, uh, in terms of the geography and history of, of democracy. Um, and then maybe only at the end bring it back and say, all right, what, what, what lessons should we, should we bring with us in trying to think about this moment? Um, and look, you are pushing out and against in all kinds of ways. You're encouraging us to think anew about where democracy comes from, um, what democracy means, what different versions of democracy might look like, and conjointly what sort of versions of autocracy might look like. And, 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 and you started off your comments here, it's a central theme of your book, it's where your book starts off, is by recognizing or making the point that democracy was not just born in Athens, right? That we can think about it being much more pervasive. And give us a couple of examples. Can you say a little bit about, here? we see it over here in these times, and how, what it, how it looks, where it appears, um, at, uh, at an early stage? So it, it often appears uh, in places where, first of all, I've emphasized this, where there is not some strong central state or perhaps that strong central state has collapsed. If you think about the Greek world, uh, prior to the existence of democracy in Greece uh, in the Bronze Age, there were kingdoms. There were kings with court bureaucrats who had technologies involving forms of writings that were very complicated and hard to learn from the general populace. Uh, and they were autocracies, and they collapsed. And the collapse of that order allowed for a newer form of governance and form of early democracy. Now, I'm not saying that collapse is the recipe that we would like to see in order to get uh, democracy, but that's the way it sometimes happened. In other cases, I think the environment led to a, a, a situation that if there was a lot of land, for example, relative to how many people there were, and if they practiced a form of agriculture that allowed them to move quite easily from one place to another, uh, then there was an exit option that placed a check on anyone as a chief who would try to rule in an overbearing manner. And as you know, the interesting thing about that is that exit option is something that gets described for multiple different areas of the globe. So it's described uh, very frequently for pre-colonial Africa, where it's an area that has very high land to labor ratio and where individual groups, if they're unhappy with uh, how it has, uh, has been organized, uh, authors have told us, could simply move off to another area. And so that presents a check on the ability of someone to rule uh, in, a, in an overbearing fashion. One finds the same thing for uh, societies in North America prior to European conquest, such as the Huron or the Wendat, who they called them, as they called themselves, uh, where, again, it was a form of agriculture that was, that was easy to move there was a lot of land relative to people, and so the exit option allowed for early democracy to exist and placed a constraint on, on rulers. So that's one example mm -hmm. that I provide you. Great, and then in sort of summarizing across these various examples that are in the book, you, you then introduce this notion of early democracy and contrast that with <coughs> modern democracy. And as you, as you noted in your remarks, um, roughly 
early democracy looks like the continuous and intense involvement with a, a reasonably narrow subset of a population in engaging matters of rule and rulemaking, whereas modern democracy is sort of broader in its reach into a populace, but more sporadic in terms of its engagement. That's right, and I think early democracy, the extent of participation really varied depending upon the scale of the, the society. So if you took societies where there was basically no governance above the level of an individual village, mm -hmm. then it would be common to have actually quite broad participation. Uh, and sometimes broad participation, not just for men, but for women as well, which of course is something that was not true in European polities until you know, much, much, much more recently. But it is true in early democracies that got slightly larger. So for example, you would have maybe a chiefdom uh, composed of several localities, then you would tend to see that participation, the fraction of the population that participated on a very frequent basis became more restricted. Yes. Uh, and so it's, some people have questioned, they say, well, is that more like an oligarchy or would you want to give that perhaps a better name? To me, what's striking is it's still a fundamentally different ways, a way of ruling than compared to ruling through a state bureaucracy. Uh -huh. Even if the number of people who participate begins to shrink as you, as you go up the ladder in terms of how large a polity is. So within early democracies, you see our notions of democracy th thriving in smaller settings, and they become kind of narrowed as the geographic region and the size of the population increases. That's, that's right. I think it's a, it's a, the fundamental issue um, was how to preserve some form of collective governance when politics is no longer only a face-to-face -face engagement. So if you think about coming back to the Huron or uh, their neighbors to the south, the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee as they called themselves, there was a structure that was quite complicated of having council level governance at the village level at the level of each tribe, as Europeans call them, uh, and then at the confederation level as well. And so examples like that, I think, are somewhat rare. There, aren't, there are others in the historical record from elsewhere, but there aren't that many. That's a society, that, two societies, that succeeded in preserving a form of early democracy, even if they covered a, a fairly substantial territory. For most early democracies, I think it was much more localized than that. It was really only if it was quite a small polity of a, you know, a village size or something slightly larger where you would have that very broad participation and participation was a face-to-face -face affair. So I wonder how, how far you want to go with this. That is, we have this distinction between early democracy and modern democracy, and, and in some ways, one could argue, no, that early democracy was more democratic than modern democracy, at least at the local level, and in terms of the continuous involvement of a polity and engagement of the polity in ways that is not so common in the context of a modern democracy. Do you want to? Do you want to? No, go that no, far? no. I'd, I'd say that I think I think I would go there, and I'd say that you know, it, at its best, early democracy was like the New England town meeting that Ro Norman Rockwell painted, right? And the idea, and I think actually the the New England town meeting arises from a, a similar set of events where there was no strong central state, people were spread across a large area. People had an exit option, and so you got collective governance occurring in, in a way that is often described as being uh, somehow more democratic than what we think of our, our form of democracy today. Uh, and so I just say that it wasn't only the New England town meeting where that was practiced, it was a yeah. lot of other societies as well. And yeah. in fact, societies that practice that form of governance in the same place before they were supplanted by Europeans. Yeah, okay, good. We need to say a word about autocracy, I think, as well. So it's the point of contrast. Um, and yet, in various, having recognized some variation on the democracy side, you also, throughout the book, make a point of saying in different places, well, that even autocrats require some measure of support among or consent within the governed. Um, sometimes only tacit, sometimes actively engaged. And that the idea that an autocracy can be reduced to simply one individual having, it's almost always a he, his way over an entire population is to miss ways in which the views of the larger public um, creep into even that system of government. No? Yes, that's right. And uh, the, the, the term autocracy itself is a misnomer because 
apart from maybe a few very, very rare exceptions that I'm unaware of, no one has ever truly rolled uniquely on their own. Uh, what I think uh, is key to autocracy is that apart from tacit consent, the, the form of collecting information about what the people think is fundamentally different. Uh, though, so the form of uh, th thinking about how information is collected in the Western European pattern, say from the medieval and early modern period, is to have a council or an assembly or a parliament, whatever it's called, and have a representatives who are chosen by localities, and then they meet in centrally, and information is sought from them about how unhappy the people might be, whether there might be consent for this or something. So that has a sort of form of consent that operates in that way where you have members of society coming directly. Uh, the Chinese model provides the opposite way of getting the information, which is a sense as it, as it evolves, once the examination system gets going and once the system for selecting bureaucrats gets, gets perfected, it involves, again, trying to seek information about the local populace and how things are going and how unhappy people might be. But instead, it's not sought by having a representative from the particular region come and meet in a council. It's instead done by having bureaucrats who are centrally trained and who would likely, as the policy was, come from another region, be stationed there, and then to report back. So two alternative Similar ways, but in, in the same time, very different ways of getting information, I think. But this is interesting. I mean, the, the, what the distinction then between democracy and autocracy for you has to do with different modes of transmitting, collecting and transmitting information. That's right. It's not centrally about who the, whose views are represented or even how formally how power is wielded. It's about the collection of information and how it then informs decisions that are ultimately made. Yeah, and then the further step to that is it's not necessarily just about information, but it's also about actual governance. So in Western Europe, for a very long time, tax collection is delegated to local cities. So if you think the Cortes of Spain, up until uh, the 17th century, tax collection is very decentralized. So it's not just information, it relies on the fact that the cities who send representatives to the Cortes are the ones who do the collection of taxes. There's no central bureaucracy that does this. And so that's the other key thing that it makes a big difference for who gets heard, I think, in the end. So there's the information channel, but also the fact that if you have to rely on these people themselves to collect the taxes, then you're in a somewhat weaker position than if you can collect the taxes on your, on if you, your, whether you have the people that can go and try to collect them. Yes. Okay, so let's bring, <laughs> let's bring the administrative state, the federal, the bureaucracy. Yes into full view, because you've got an argument about not just what distinguishes democracies and autocracies, but which path nations go, which, which path they pursue, which is a function um, in no small part of, of the prior existence of a bureaucracy. And that where there is a bureaucracy, we're more likely then to lean towards autocracy but where there isn't uh, 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 an administrative apparatus that's capable of extracting, levying taxes and collecting them, and then also collecting the information and transmitting that, then we're more likely to go down the democracy route. And in that sense, uh, for all the strengths of democracy, it's born of a kind of governing weakness. Absolutely, absolutely. And for a long time, it's less effective than autocracy, if you want to put it that way. If you think about how much the kings of France uh, or England could raise in terms of taxes circa 1300 of the Common Era, it's only about one-tenth of what the Song Dynasty was raising in terms of taxes. So it's actually, for very long, a very weak phenomenon of governance. Weak if you consider the it reek from the perspective of you know, how, strong, how, 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 how much of an ability does the state have to extract revenue to do something. Well, and therefore, and to do something. That's right. right? It's not just extracting money. Song Dynasty is not just extracting money and then sitting on the money. Right. It's then undertaking tasks. Um, and to the extent that there's a correspondence between the doings of government and the wishes of the people, right? That then this is another way in which you might say this is a this is a state that's flourishing in ways that initially democracy struggles. That's right. It's born of weakness. It can it it gets less money. It can do fewer things, and there's this dependency that's running all the way through it between those who who would rule and a dispersed group of people who have stronger exit options, 
who, who, whose views are less well known to the governing body? Yeah? That's right. And so the, the, and that's, you know, the critical point then is if you think about the, the Western European or, or, or American um, examples, uh, 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 democracy in conjunction with a strong state is not something that occurs until very, very late in the game. They think of all these European monarchs who were raising taxes and they must have been powerful, but in fact, it's really not until the 19th century that we see uh, dramatic increases in state capacity, such as the ability, even you know, as late as the 19th century, most European uh, polities did not have a cadastral register that could say who owned what and who produced what. Yeah. 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 Okay, so in the United States, we're inching towards present period, present context. In the United States, you see this massive expansion of the administrative state really in mid 20th century. Right. There's a case in the progressive era for the creation of a more independent, more robust civil service. And then we see this massive rise in the number of federal employees, number of agencies doing things. Um, should we think about its emergence as an enhancement or a threat to democracy? Referencing your earlier argument that its prior existence sends you down one road or right. another. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity, it's a positive thing as long as Congress is uh, willing and able to, to, to pro pro play its role of sort of supervision of what goes on with the bureaucracy. What I, the one thing I'd question, and you're more of an expert on this area than I am, but what we've seen subsequent to that development of the administrative state is the, an increasing tendency for presidents of both parties to rule through executive order. Yeah. Uh, and at, at it, that, that's a potentially destabilizing force because it's taking you to a world where you're no longer thinking about the, you know, the, the president and the Congress jointly managing this thing out there, which is called the bureaucracy, which has always been the way in which modern democracy could coexist with a bureaucracy. And it's perhaps inching towards a, a pattern where um, uh, Congress is no longer playing that role and where the executive, I don't want to use the word usurp uh, because that's too strong, but maybe has increasingly asserting uh, power to do things by executive uh, order rather than having it go through uh, ordinary legislation. And, and more broadly, do you want to say that there's a threat, and this is what you observe in when thinking about the trajectory of state development for early democracies and autocracies, that would-be rulers usurp or capture the administrative apparatus and deploy it for their own purposes? Yes, that's the greatest risk. That's the greatest risk. And then that in conjunction with the other risk that people become, because they're not really participating as frequently as, as they would, would in an early democracy, become disenchanted, distrustful, just generally disconnected from government. So those two things in conjunction, I think, pose, pose a lot, a great danger. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, there's this other purpose, though, of um, bureaucracies, uh, which are, are not just about collecting taxes um, or collecting information for a would-be ruler, but for doing things. Right. And doing things presumably that a population wants. And a population that looks up at a government uh, and has all these hopes and expectations that are never met, that is frustrated at every turn, is one that is uh, uh, vulnerable to the entreaties of a would-be autocrat, no? That's and, right. in that, and in that sense, a, a, the need for a bureaucracy, particularly in the modern era where the expectations of a government have expanded, I'm not talking about just the United States more generally, um, the expectations of government have expanded so dramatically. We turn to the state for all kinds of things that presumably people in, you know, in uh, 2,000 years ago, they weren't turning to the state to- No, see, that's see absolutely value. right, and they weren't, and so, it, 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 that's right, it's a trick of this. Simultaneously, there was no state and that was, you know, in a sense that, I don't want to call it the libertarian solution because people thought, didn't think of it in those terms at that time, but would be a fairly decent guarantee against autocracy because how is an autocrat going to rule without any sort of a state? But at the same time, yes, you do run the risk then. If it, and it also depends upon how a bureaucracy is constructed. What is it constructed to do? Is it constructed to uh, raise revenue and then fund agencies that are desiring to maintain order externally and maybe internally also? Or is it doing things? And this, we, this came up in the earlier discussion today where we talked about, say, Medicare involves a very large bureaucracy administering that. that, that that's not a group of people who are going to sort of take over and turn the U.S. into an autocracy if it would be autocrat um, 
uh, was, was in a position to think about doing that. So it probably matters to a great deal what the bureaucracy is there to do and how it's designed. And to me, that comes back to, again, the point of what role the legislature plays in designing and keeping, keeping, keeping controls on the bureaucracy, but also seeing that it has the resources and ability and design to do the things that they'd like it to do and not to do things that the, they would not like it to do. And part of the project of would-be autocrats today, it seems to me, is not just to capture or deploy the administrative state, but in some ways to it to, to delegitimize it, to undermine it, yes. kneecap it, which is an interesting thing, right? Because you've got, at the front end, you've got, here's this administrative state that I can put to use, and I no longer have this dependence on local assemblies. I can put to use to collect taxes and do the things that I want to do. Um, and, and, and that's what allows an autocrat to assume power. But we see a different kind of dynamic playing out, at least in some countries, in Poland, in the United States under yes. Trump, I would argue, um, where there is a, there's a sort of assault on the administrative state. Yes, there's an attempt to delegitimize it when it resists you. Yes. I think is the, is the key thing. And there, there are elements, if it doesn't resist you, then you don't need to delegitimize it. Yeah. But if it does resist you because people are, uh, you know, in, in the bureaucracy have a strong tradition of, of supporting democratic norms, of working together with Congress, et cetera, then you have to delegitimize it. Yeah. Uh, exactly as, uh, as has been happening in a number of countries in the way you describe. Terrific. I want to, I want to turn to the audience after one last question. So get yours ready. Um, one last question, which is, you, you wrote this before, you started this before Trump? That's right. I, I, I started this project before Donald Trump was even a candidate for president. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, you wrote it encouraging us to think much more expansively about the origins of democracy, where it comes from, the shape of democracy, and, and recognizing in no small part that even before Trump, that democracy is vulnerable um, in ways that maybe many of us didn't appreciate as much as we ought to have. And I wonder, at kind of at a, at a large level, are there lessons from the, that, that flow from um, this more expansive outlook? And yeah, yeah. In I, terms of how we confront the vulnerabilities of democracy I, today. I think one, I mean, obviously we need to do a lot of very current work to see what's going on, but I do think taking a very long term historical view can help us to see patterns that we might have otherwise ignored or no longer thought about. And so just one example of that is history suggests that it's actually quite difficult to maintain a democracy at scale. Mm -hmm. Now, I learned in school, and you probably learned in school, that you know, James Madison found the answer to this by saying, no, an extended republic is going to be less divisive and turbulent than a, than a small republic. But it, he might not have been right about that, actually. If you look at levels of trust in government today, they're actually higher in small democracies than they are in large democracies. And so that doesn't mean that, well, we just have to give up and say we can't do anything, but it means that perhaps we need to be attentive to the fact that democracy is harder to maintain in a very large, um, in a very large country. And so we need to see about what we can do, what kind of investments we can make to think about better connecting uh, citizens to government in light of this fact that scale is still a challenge. And, and so that is a, 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 a cause for worry about contemporary arrangements. Might we also say uh, is, democracy has been a feature of human history in one form or another for a very long time and find some refuge in, yes, in and, that? And, and that depends what you're thinking of. Is, I mean, some people have this idea that if American democracy disappears, then that's the end of democracy for all times. And I think that, that, that that's a, a, you know, it gives ourselves a little bit too much credit. Uh, that, that precisely for the reasons I try to out, lay out in the book, that democracy has been something that's been present in a lot of different societies for a very long time. Uh, and so it's hard to think that this fundamental way that humans have chosen to govern themselves over time is just going to disappear. Now, that doesn't mean that our democracy is not going to hit the rocks and have problems and, 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 and have things get much worse. It's, it's encouraging, at least, if you're thinking about for humanity, will democracy still, still survive in some way, in some point? I think it'll, I think it'll make it through. Yeah. But whether our democracy makes it through is another question. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Let's open it up. I, I believe that there are... And this, we've got a son banking off of all kinds of ways. Um, we've got um, microphones for anybody who is interested in 
asking a question. I see a question. question at the back. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that many would observe that uh, right now, or, or rather make the connection that there is a relationship between growing economic insecurity and anxiety and uh, some of this anti-democratic sentiment. Uh, around the world. Um, so I'm curious from like a historical perspective, or rather if you would just agree with that assessment, or rather uh, from a historical perspective, if you see that relationship uh, throughout history of economic empowerment leading to pro-democratic movements, or alternatively, you know, economic insecurity and anxiety um, being related to the decline of democracy. Well, let, let me answer that question in, in light of um, trends in inequality, which I think you know, economic insecurity is very, very closely related to. And it would be nice if it was the case that there was a sort of self-regulating mechanism within modern democracy that since all adults, for the most part, get to vote, uh, and those who are economically insecure outnumber those who are economically secure, that once economic security insecurity got too high or once inequality got too high, that there would be a, a, a regulating mechanism whereby candidates would be elected who would choose policies that would do something about the problem. Uh, and you might even think that the wealthy might give in to that because they'd rather see, not see a revolution and have themselves be expropriated. So that would be the self-regulating mechanism. But in practice, I don't think if you look at the, the countries for which we have long-run data on inequality and look at when they became democracies and how long were their democracies for, many countries, particularly those in Western Europe in the early part of the 20th century, uh, were arguably democracies, but with extremely high levels of inequality. And it's not clear that any democracy itself did anything for inequality. So I think what that means is it leads us to a rather striking conclusion is that Democracy is much more resistant to inequality than we might think, but that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Because it means that democracy still exists in terms of we have elections, we have multiple political parties and so on, but this fundamental goal of having there be general well-being is not being provided for. Other questions? I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to the question of um, strong state, weak state, and democracy that, um, uh, you know, so you've already laid out the framework in which democracy can flourish or not. But it is striking that um, the major democracies we can think of in history have also been unstoppable imperial powers who really only ended when they collapsed of their own incoherence or hypocrisy or uh, excessive ambition and we're really not stopped by external enemies with the, uh, the possible exception of um, the French uh, marching across all the way to, to, to Russia. So I wonder if you could address that um, in, 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 and explain how that fits with your larger framework of democratic governance being a weaker, less capable mode of, of uh, organizing. Yeah, I, I think uh, what there's a big distinction there, to my mind, between European democracy and democracy elsewhere. In that, if you think of European democracy from Athens, early democracy onwards to, say, the UK in the 19th century, once they pass uh, and expand the suffrage, it's very clear that the idea of ruling in a sort of democratic fashion at home does not apply to the way you rule people who are else who are others who you rule from abroad and who you conquer. And so that's an unfortunate feature of democracy that it doesn't seem to, no one has, people have tried to think of a universal standard for democracy that it should imply that, that all people should be treated that way irrespective of whether they're foreigners or citizens, uh, but often hasn't been the case. Uh, and so I think that's, a, that's, a, that's precisely why we see that a lot of early democracies existed in some place prior to European conquest and then Europeans come in who even if they were democratic at home and certainly don't act in a democratic uh, way in the conquered countries and, and often very, very far from that. Uh, so it's an interesting question. But coming back to the other early democracies I think of in other, in other areas, it's not clear 
that they had the same aggressive nature, although sometimes they did. Uh, sometimes they did. The small, yes. sort of largely agrarian early democracies is what you have in mind. Then. That's right. Yeah. Hi, uh, could you speak a little bit about uh, post-colonial democracies and if you find that the character of these post-colonial dem uh, democracies in the modern world uh, is somehow different from uh, Western European or America's democracy, perhaps? Yeah, I, 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 mean, I think it's different in the extent to which uh, modern, the institutions we have of modern democracy emerged over a long time, over a long time where a theory of political representation was developed in the medieval era where various institutions were developed and eventually um, comes to, to fruition <coughs> at some point in the late 18th or 19th centuries, depending upon where you want to draw the line. Now, that's a sort of endogenous development. Post-colonial democracy is a much different phenomenon. You may have, in many cases, a areas of a polity an area that was practicing early democracy or something resembling it, uh, then Europeans come in and they colonize. Europeans, generally, the colonial order did two things in many cases. It encouraged, first of all, that if local groups, say in, in central, in the Congo, often had a, tra a tra tendency to elect their chiefs, the Belgians did away with that. Uh, the Belgian order itself is, is, of course, the farthest thing from democracy that you can think of. And so it sort of smashes early democracy. Uh, and then what happens once the colonizers leave is you get this form of modern democracy that's directly imported, but it's directly imported in a way that's, it, it's a fundamentally different beast from the early democracy that existed before. And I think that has led to a lot of uh, sort of a very caricatured commentators on, on saying, well, are, is this country ready for democracy or something like that? Mm -hmm. It may be that it was ready for democracy a long time ago before you intervened as, as a European colonizer, but it's just that now you're inserting an entirely new set of institutions and there have to be patterns of behavior that, that, that lead to that actually succeeding or not succeeding. Does that answer your question? No, I'm not saying it's necessarily weak, because what's interesting is it's actually been quite strong. Uh, if you think of the fraction of the world today, the fraction of the world population today, and I have a graph on that in the book, that is governed under something that can be uh, called a democracy, is higher than it's been in 200 years. So to me, roughly half. And so to me, that's actually quite an astonishing and positive development. I'm just saying that there are cases where this idea, the, the, the direct adoption of someone else's form of democracy is something that can pose challenges. Um, I guess over history, would you say that homogeny within the population has led to stronger democracies or people more engaged versus when there's heterogeneity amongst the population that that leads to more collapse of institutions? I think what's been critical is that some societies have, uh, and societies, could, it depends on what you, because there can be all sorts of homogeneity or heterogeneity, of course, you know, ethnic ties, uh, class, gender, what have you. Uh, and there are, what's, what's striking is some early democracies came up with really ingenious ways of trying to deal with division and restructure themselves as a function of this. Uh, and there's a, I'll tell you two examples that are, that are from very different periods that closely resemble each other. So um, one of the reforms that's, that's taken place uh, in, in Athens uh, under Cleisthenes is that they moved away from a system where there were previously four tribes, as they were called, that were geographically unique in each location and were in competition with one another and led to a lot of fractious politics. And what he does is he creates a set of, implements a set of reform where they create 10 new artificial tribes that you belong to instead of the old four. And these, each of these tribes the tri is present in all different parts 
of the Athenian polity. And so it's no longer this sort of geographic polarization. It's like as if you took people from my home neighborhood in, in Greenwich Village and say, you are now identifying with these people in Wyoming or something like that, right? Uh, and the same thing exactly happens under the Iroquois, or the Haudenosaunee, as they call themselves, in that they have uh, a series of a small number of tribes, as Europeans called them. And you could think that that was a recipe for division, but what they create is a clan system that cross-cuts the tribe. So you could be a member of one clan and have an affinity with someone else, even if they were from a different tribe. And so what I would say then is that some early democracies have been very successful in coming up with ingenious ways of trying to bind their societies closer together, uh, and that we haven't made much effort in recent years in the US to think about things that way. Can I try a slightly different angle at the same question? Sure. I think, um, which is in trying to take your argument on its own terms about the original problem that a would-be state leader faces and it's an informational problem. In a world in which there is no diversity, everybody is of a singular type, right? Um, that then the challenge of collecting information is not as great, mm -hmm. um, and therefore the need for a bureaucracy, a robust bureaucracy to solve that problem is not as acute, which then would lend itself, no, to autocracy. I'm just trying to take your argument. Yeah, I, oh, okay, I think I, I was, I, I think what you would say actually is to the, if, to start off with the assumption that a bureaucrat has less information than local people do about conditions. It's actually, if people are more likely to be the same from one local, locality to another, that would actually tilt you in favor of the bureaucratic option. So I think what you're, if it's, you know, if it's not that hard, I, yes. if it's not that hard. And, and so what I think, I, I, what I'd conclude from that is actually diversity might be more uh, supportive of democracy, democracy in that regard, in, that regard in the sense of, yes, if d diversity means there's a lot of different things going on out there. And so for anyone at the center trying to control things, it's just inherently more difficult. Yes. 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 <clears throat> One thing you have, okay, no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just asking a question to, 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 fill, the, to fill the blank space. Um, but could you, I mean, I want to come back a bit to something that Will brought up earlier, which, which is the, the, your, your point about the democracy arising from weak states uh, in Europe in particular. And do you mean there that they're weakly bureaucratic states? Because I think of the example of the Roman Republic, which was weakly bureaucratic, but it was extremely strong militarily. So. Um, there, there are different ways that, that states or polities or whatever we want to call um, you know, political you know, organizations can be weak or, or strong. And so I'd, I'd like you to sort of unpack a bit more what the differences are and the categories of weakness and strength that you're using. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very useful um, distinction that if one wanted to get uh, drill down more and thinking about bureaucracy in a more detailed way, that would be exactly the way to go. Because you can imagine states uh, such as China at times, for example, where the bureaucracy is incredibly strong in terms of its ability to know what was going on, who was producing what and how much they could tax, but didn't have a very strong apparatus militarily for internal enforcement of things via force. Um, and that's the sort of the opposite of the Roman case where the bureaucracy is, as you say, weakly bureaucratized, I think, to the extent that there wasn't a central tax register or much, not much knowledge uh, apart from the census. But you do have an incredibly strong military force that can, you, can, you can use, use and was used to go, you know, commit violence, shall we say, uh, <laughs> in a way. And so I think that's a different, right? It's also, but I think it's, 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 it's not as effective uh, a, a form because in, have the only use, if you only, the only use you have, the only strategy you have is be able to resort to violence, then it's very costly each time you have to do that. Uh, and it's less, less productive than trying to find out the information another way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can you, say, we haven't, you haven't said this, but it pops up in the book in a bunch of places, um, the, the phenomenon of representative mandates this notion, right, that those who represent us 
have to sort of check in with us regularly less before they make any decision. And if they fail to do so, I mean, they, they, they can suffer all form of punishments. And that a transition from early to modern is a kind of relaxation for the most part. That's right. Of those mandates, which you might think about is creating greater distance between those we elect and we the people, mm -hmm. which is a, it's not an, I mean, in some ways it's an enhancement of democracy, in other ways it's not. Right, I think it makes democracy feasible mm -hmm. at, at, at scale, but it's at a cost. And so if you look at um, polities as diverse as, I'll keep mentioning the Huron, but that's another good example where they would have had an equivalent of a mandate system or the Dutch Republic or a lot of uh, European uh, representative assemblies in the medieval and the early modern era, the mandate was the norm. And this is a way in which local communities have said, we're no longer self-governing only ourselves, we're participating in this larger entity to whom, an assembly to whom we send a representative, but we as local people would like to gain as much control as we could, or retain as much control as we could. And the way you do that is if you can say to someone who you're choosing to go, you can agree to pay this much in terms of taxes and no more. Uh, and if we come back and, and we find out that you've agreed to more, then you're gonna have a problem. We can actually discipline you or even kill you as the, the one example that I cite in the book. Uh, and that's a very strong control on someone. But it also makes things very impractical at the center from the point of achieving a decision, getting something done. Uh, the Dutch Republic suffers greatly from this because they have this system of mandates where people are constantly having to shuttle back before and back to city councils to like redesign, see, see if what could be agreed on, and then go to a central council. And it takes a lot of time and they often can't agree to anything at all. Versus the English um, across the channel who get away, get, do away with mandates from a very early date and it simply said to localities, you cannot bind yourselves. You cannot ask, no, I can't decide this before I have to go back and, and decide some, and, you know, and consult my, my constituents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating. <coughs> Last questions. Yes. Hi, right. so based on your, the knowledge you have and the research you've done regarding democracies, like how useful do you think democracy indexes are to evaluate how advanced, how developed and developed a democracy is? Uh, you know, it's curious. It, I would, one would think it's, uh, it's very hard to measure that and that these indices uh, come up with uh, different classifications. The, the funny thing about them is though they're designed in very different ways, they often tend to arrive at fairly similar judgments. So I, I think we would be throwing the baby out with the bath to say that we should not be engaging in democracy in this season as well, if you're covering, if you're trying to look at a broad brush of countries. I think where they're much less helpful is if you want to think about any one country's evolution from year to year and say like, oh, because uh, Freedom House decided that this one country loses a couple points this year, that suddenly things must have radically changed. Because maybe they did, maybe they didn't. There are advantages to subjective versus ob objective in indices. Uh, you know, in a way, one of the simplest ways to define modern democracy um, was come up with my, by my NYU colleague, um, Adam Shaworski, who used, to, who used to teach here at the University of Chicago in the political science department. And, he basically said that the modern democracy is a system where incumbents sometimes lose. And that's a very minimalist, very powerful way of defining it. Basically, that means that there are elections. There are elections that are contested by multiple parties. And it's not always the same party that wins. And to my mind, that actually does gets you a long way towards thinking about a definition of what a democracy, it doesn't mean that a democracy is good or bad, or, but just thinking about does it exist and is it maintained or not, and perhaps better to have a minimalist definition rather than to have some of the indices that are much more complicated that involve so much more uh, making of judgment calls. Which Thanks. rationalizes how you use those data in your book. You use it once in order to show the rise of democracy, referencing the chart that you talked about earlier. But when you dive into all your case studies, they don't make much of an appearance. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Terrific. We've come to the end of our hour together. Um, this was terrifically stimulating. Um, 
We, I want to let you all know about the next event as part of the democracy series with the Seminary Co-op and the Chicago Center on Democracy, which is going to be held on Tuesday, November 2nd, when we'll sit down with Spencer Ackerman to talk about his book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Um, that one's going to have lots of well, Reign of Terror, right? There it is, right? <laughs> okay, it's been a, a terrific book. Um, uh, so check out um, on the Chicago Center on Democracy's webpage, the Seminary Co-op, the Center on Effective Government. We'll have more information on it. Um, David, you're going to be uh, available to sign copies of the book um, afterwards. Um, thank you all for being here and for such a stimulating conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me Great. once again. Great. 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 Great.